Okay, then first I start with thanking my, my, my students for most of the uh, new work. The old work I did myself together with Roland Zimmermann. And these are experimentalists who inspired us with wonderful experiments and also made sure, um, nice, beautiful pictures that I hope you will enjoy as much as I will enjoy, as I enjoy them. So this is the outline. I start with very old stuff about Anderson localization, but that's very short because you already had that. Then I have some good old stuff from my own, from my, my own work. Essentially, I, we ask ourselves, I, what kind of quantum physics related to Anderson localization and so on and so forth are we able to see in the semiconductor systems? And then I more or less got out of this exciton semiconductor disorder business. And now in recent, in recent times, we looked at other surprises in, lo in localization physics, nicely systems, and hotspots in sec mnemonic generation from zinc oxide nanoneedles. That's waves, that's localization, but it's not this order. And then it's this order, but not semiconductors. And that's even, that's even metals, but also waves and also nice localization features. And uh, my last view graph of so is an homage to our theoretical, uh, to the localization landscape, which I find very inspiring and which I thought is really a great new addition to our thinking about localization. So that was the first view graph about Anderson localization. Somebody called it a big elephant in the, in the room. And <laughs> so I'm skipping this view graph. It's a big elephant. I'm sorry, you said the same here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and only reduce it to very, to very few, very few facts and fact, factoids about Anderson localization, what people generally think. Generally think that one or two dimensional disordered systems are localized. Three-dimensional disordered systems can typically have localized states at the band edges and delocalized states in the middle and the, mobility and the localization edge in between. And this is a famous, famous three-dimensional Anderson localized wave functions, multifactor, and so on and so forth from Rudo Römer's group, which I think is also on Wikipedia if you look up at Anderson localization. This is our two-dimensional Locali localization pictures that I showed ma very many times in my life. This is a disordered potential, and in a disordered potential in the minimum, there can be classically easily understandable states, essentially parabolic potential, and therefore harmonic oscillator states with one or two or three and so Hermitian polynomials. Or there can be these more localized, more delocalized, more multifractal, exponentially localized type of Anderson. Anderson type of states, and that's how these states look like. That's a different way how to look at this, at this, at these kind of states. That's real state pictures of low-lying states. That's Fourier space. If you Fourier transform essentially in, in Gaussian or Hermitian polynomial times a Gaussian, you get again a Fourier a Hermitian polynomial times Gaussian or a Gaussian. So that's these low-lying, very deep, very well localized states in these deep minima. And if you fully, fully, fully transform these kind of states, you find essentially a ring, which is a rephrasing by mathematics for the fact that essentially you, can e you see something like a typical wavelength given by the energy. So this state is is localized, but it's composed out of, it is composed out of, uh, out of plane waves, and therefore it remembers the energy, the energy uh, the E times K relation, H times K squared is equal is A E energy. And so therefore, if you make a Fourier transform, you get these kind of rings. That's my thinking of how these states look like. That's a small that's a relative of the big elephant, that's a small elephant. And the small elephant is weak localization. Probably also most of you know what the weak localization is. That if you have a radar wave going to, uh, to a cloud and you collect how much the radar, how much this, and you look how, what the reflection is, you get a very famous result that if the detector is not close to the source, you get some signal, but if the detector is very close to the source, you get an enhanced backscattering by a universal factor of two. That's, I think, already discovered by the British in Second World War when they invented radar, one of the first things to discover. It's an amazing, nice, fact that you get this factor of two that's only universal. It's universal because essentially it's a large N theory. You, you scatter very often. 
And if you want to see it the next time you fly in the air, you fly, you fly back home or so, and if you see the shadow of your airplane, if you see the shadow on your airplane or, or on the above the clouds, you will see that around the airplane it's this broken spectra enhanced backscattering, and therefore it's brighter around the shadow. So that's a short reminder of weak localization, the small elephant in the room. And so I started, I st so Anderson localization started long, long ago, some 30 years ago, there was a lot about Anderson localization of light. It made it up to the cover picture of nature at that time. And we did localization of excitons in the early 2000s with a couple of, and I presented some of these stuff here at this conference because Claude remembers this and I love to talk about the good old days. And so, we, but right now what I'm actually really doing is essentially localization of light 2.0, part of this big community thinking at the moment we should reconsider re uh, localization of light. So, what did, how did I get into it? How did, did I get into this? We had, at, we had, that was, we had somebody doing um, microphotoluminescence micro, micro spectra of excitons in quantum wells, gallium arsenide quantum wells at that, at that time. And so you saw in microphotoluminescence, you saw a lot of sharp lines. And uh, Uwe Jahn from the Paul Trude Institute next doors in Berlin asked me, can you do some theory for this? And so I was back in the same situation like Wigner and Dyson was in the 1930s, when in the 1930s they were asked, can you do some theory for this nuclear spectra, which is the thousands or ten thousands excitation of nuclei. And at that time, Wigner and Dyson looked at this and they asked a very ingenious question. Um, can we learn something from this? Should, can we learn something from this? And so they, they asked themselves the question, maybe I cannot learn anything from this. So let's, these are obviously eigenstates of something, but let's look at eigenstates of random matrices. Just put random numbers into a big matrix, diagonalize it, and look at the eigenstates of this random matrix. And if these, these results of this diagonalization of random matrices look like this, then essentially you cannot learn anything from that. So essentially, that's what we all, that's why this, it's as universal and it's about the same like the central limit theorem. Once you have a Gaussian, once you have a Gaussian line shape, you cannot really understand the origin of the Gaussian. You just know there has to be average over, of, about a lot of things, which you will never recover from looking at the Gaussian. So essentially, we will never recover what the excitons are actually doing if that is about the same. And so I learned what random matrix theory is. This very nice, beautiful little thing of what are what happens to the eigenvalues and eigenstates of this random matrix of this of such random matrices, and there are three results found at that time, which um, I think one should earn as a theoretical physicist should learn early, early just because it's so much fun. You can ask for the density of states of random matrices, and that looks like a water droplet for good reasons, but that's not but that's not very useful. You hardly ever see this. The other thing is you can ask for typical, typical eigenfunctions of random matrices. And the only thing that you know is it's, they have norm one because they're normalized. And therefore they are somehow on an n-dimensional sphere. But that's all that you know. And if you really care for this, you can calculate the probability to find a certain coordinate. Say that coordinate number one has a certain value. You can, you can calculate this as a Porter-Thomas distribution that will I show that because later in my talk that will show up. So just pick any point of a pick any point of large high dimensional sphere and ask yourself what is the distribution of coordinates. That's I will come back later to that and the, and the most famous result for random matrices is the is the level distances. So that if you calculate these eigenvalues they are not Poissonian distributed like the real random numbers but they typically have these eigenvalues, like the nuclear spectra at that time, essentially looked not homogeneous, not as, as random as Poisson's, but they have a typical level distance distribution. This is the famous wigner dice magenta distribution here. That's a, distrib that's a distribution of level distances. So if you have any questions what I'm talking about, but I think it's just ask me. So this is famous result, well known from this nuclear 
mathematicians love that it's also the distribution of zeros of the zeta function and so on and so forth for, under, for not understood reasons, uh, for as far as I know at least. So that was the introduction, now coming to the excitons. Uh, excitons are beautiful. Claude in the first talk mentioned the quantum size effect and this is a picture I love to show that if you have excitons in small little quantum dots, they have different colors depending just on the size of the quantum dots. It's all the same material, just different size and therefore different colors. And so what is an exciton? For those who don't know it, an exciton is essentially an, an electron going around a hole in the semiconductor, making some kind of, hydro of hydrogen atom type of state. Our, our modeling of excitons in quantum well, essentially, uh, Sergei, Sergei mentioned earlier today, is essentially a center, the exciton factorizing in the center of mass motion and a relative motion, and then arguing that the center of mass motion is essentially a a point, a quantum mechanical particle in a, random, in, a, in a much smoother random potential. Once again, what should this picture be? This should be a quantum well. This is a theoretician's picture of, a theoretician's picture of uh, alloy disorder. This is my picture of a well with fluctuations. Both of them add to the disorder. This exciton is not here. It does not like to be here because it's squeezed here. It's much more prefers over there. And therefore, if you ask the exciton, where do you like to be? The exciton tell, tells you, I love to be here, but I don't like to be here. So you map an exciton in a quantum well to a two-dimensional disorder Schrodinger equation with, a, with a, a correlated random potential. So your pool two is pretty melodious. You will ask now. Yes, right. It's so no, you're the first one to... Yeah, the first one to complain is even though I showed this 50 times already, this picture. <laughs> so. so the At that time, I just looked at this order. At di at, uh, for me, at this end, at, at the end of the day, I had a single particle. I had a single particle Schrödinger equation with an effective potential, which, yeah, it, it, this is random which has some kind of correlation, but it's really not important how much correlation it has as long as this correlation of this potential is shorter than the exciton radius, and uh, exciton localization length. Yes. How are you doing? Yes. Sorry, this potential acts on the center of mass. Yes, yes. If these are really strong, if, these, if this is strong compared to the excitant binding energy, which in the old days when we talked about gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide was not strong, which in the new days with a lot of ga indium gallium nitride are strong, and therefore a lot of these results are not applicable to your system. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> I haven't been out of this business for some time, and um, but I but I, I dare to show these results because the next few graphs, what we did at that time, hopefully are inspiring for what you can also do on your favorite system. So essentially, in the, if you now look in the literature and say if you have a this equation with a random potential with a random potential, you know it's Anderson localized and the wave functions are localized. That's so that's good to know, but it would be, be better to see it. So we ask ourselves, so we ask ourselves, how do we see it? That we have Anderson localization, and how do you see the difference between Anderson between lo localization which of a quantum particle, which is also understandable classically, and lo and localization of a quantum particle is not understandable classically? How can we see this, and how we can calculate this? But how? We can calculate this line spectra, but essentially that's weak that dies or whatever, so, but it doesn't really help us. So how can we see this experimentally? So that was the question, what can we see? And so the first, uh, the one answer to what you, how you can see some Anderson physics in our system here is, 
near-field spectroscopy. We had a nice introduction this morning already. So, essential, so essentially, you will see locally a spectrum here, which is this line spectrum. We, I think we saw this Matsuda pictures also this, mo this morning in, yeah, in, a, in a talk. So, and now we can ask ourselves, if we, if we have these localized, the localized exciton in a quantum well, do I see do I see level repulsion and do I see level repulsion in the spectrum or do I don't I see level repulsion? And I don't I don't with the students I would say raise your hands and we make a vote on this. The argument why why you should not see it is essentially if you are localized here and the other one exciton is localized here, then they don't then you don't see it. If they are here, you see it somehow. So we suggest that, oh, turn it this around. And so essentially we, we said that if you now have a different spot size with your microscope and average over a large area, you should see very little, very little level repulsion. And if your region is much smaller comparable to the local localization length, then you should see level repulsion. So we argued and suggested, and some people did that, just Measure, the, measure your spectrum, look for level repulsion and as a function of your observation window and then you can measure essentially localization length. Because when you come, become small enough that all states have to overlap, then essentially you know that that's about the size of your center of mass localization length. And Duncan Steele and some student essentially made the first experiment to had at least three other groups reprodu reproduce that. Also Christoph Lino and ourselves Essentially, they had uh, the correlation function of these, of such kind of spectra. They made the autocorrelation function and looked at this for a large detection spot of four micrometers, a small detection spot of one micrometer, and they saw the autocorrelation function develops a level repulsion dip at small, distan at small distances. So essentially, that's a nice way to measure, somehow get a feeling what the localization length of the center of mass motion of these excitons is. Is it a complete, I, I cannot see it because it's a, you have the spectra, they, they see when they look one micron and four micron? They look, they look about the same for four micron and three, uh, one micron. Okay. Then you take the spectrum, take the autocorrelation, okay. and then you get essentially you get essentially with the autocorrelation, you get essentially a strong feature of every of every peak with itself. Yeah. Then you may get a level repulsion, see some level repulsion, and you also see the total shape of this. So therefore, if you um, no, if you do this autocorrelation, you see essentially something like the macroscopic absorption line folded with itself. You see the peak with it, every single peak with itself, and you see some repulsion, a dip and a change as a function of size when you do, when you do this micro PL with different, with different sizes. So that's a way to see level repulsion and Anderson physics in micro PL. Next thing is look at wave, fu in some sense look at wave functions. So we, um, if we have a delocalized, uh, local, if you have a localized exciton wave function, does it emit light? Does it couple to the light? And if you calculate this matrix element, I think we saw this formula all, I think, I don't, probably in Claude's talk, I don't remember exactly, but essentially there are a couple of factors. There is a, some factor of overlap of the S and P orbital and the atomic unit. There is a factor coming from the relative motion of the, two elect of the electron in the hole. And there is a factor coming from the overlap of the exciton center of mass wave function with the light wave. The light wave is u as huge wavelengths, therefore the light wave essentially is a one, is a one, and therefore the optical activity, the height of these indiv individual peaks, is essentially given by the overlap, the integral of the, the center of mass wave function times the light wave or the center of mass wave functions times one. That I call optical matrix element, and that determines the size and the strengths of each of these peaks. So is this exciton a very bright one or is it a dark one? Coming from the relative, coming from the relative, yeah, coming from the center of mass wave function and there could be cancellation or not cancellations. And we are, if you are still awake at this, so late at the day, 
you notice that this is already something which also occurs in the context of this localization landscape. The overlap of a wave function with the one. Here the one has a very physical meaning, namely the, wave, the light wave. So if you, do, if you do now make a statistics as a function of energy, about here is the original band edge, and it's the original band edge is now, is now broadened by this order, and you make now statistics of very deep, very low-lying individual excitons, their optical matrix element, and these optical matrix elements, you see that a very char characteristic shape that the huge, the largest, Matri optical matrix elements are close to the original band edge. If you have no disorder, then that's the only exciton that emits, the k equals zero exciton. So, and the deep, here the deep minima all look more or less the same. That's about the optim optimum fluctuation theory that Sergei Baranovsky mentioned uh, today, this result. And if you look up here, then the distribution looks like these pictures here. And this, this, so this, this distribution of optical matrix elements for, uh, obeys the Porter-Thomas distribution. So just if you take the logarithm of uh, squared and logarithm, you get a straight line. And that says essentially that the distribution of this optical matrix element just look like, look like the k equals zero component of a random matrix theory. I said if you have, if you asked on any normalized vector, what is on average the, co the average coordinate of a single coordinate, that's, that's part of Thomas. So if you do that for a Fourier transformed wave function for the k equals zero component, that's part of Thomas, and that's the distribution, nice, so that's, so therefore this distribution of optical matrix elements shows again a typical random matrix feature, and so we saw again Anderson-like random physics, random matrix here physics in this, in this Excitons and quantum welds. Next thing, how you can look at, how you can find, how you can find um, level distances is if you look at quantities that depend on wave function overlap and energy differences. So if you look at optical and no, acoustic phonon relaxation rates, are all phonon relaxation rates are natural wave quantities that depend on the overlap of the initial and the final state. And then there is some, some, Q, some Q, some Q, some e, e to the I Q or so from the phonon essentially, which you convert into energy. And so the phonon relaxation rate from exciton center of mass state alpha to exciton center of mass state beta is given by this expression. It, so it's large only if the states overlap. We heard this earlier today in the talk. And also it includes the, it includes the, level, di the level distances. And therefore, there is some, you see some, if there is level repulsion, you must see that in the phonon, in the phonon rates. And so if you look, relaxa if you look at the scattering rates from one state alpha to the state beta, you see along the, you see a dip along the diagonal. That's why I asked somebody this morning whether you had, whether you had taken out the alpha equals beta term or not. And so that's another thing where you see level repulsion in and a disorder in, a, in, in, this context, in this context here, in the phonon relaxation rates, and that goes into all, when, when you do kinetics and relaxations of excitons in, excitons in quantum wells, you can essentially, the brightness here, is the darkness says essentially, if you have a certain excitation energy, if you have a certain excitation energy, what is the chance to find a certain at the exciton at a certain detect, luminescence at a certain detection energy. If you have these kind of data, you can calculate the absorption by summing over, summing in the one diagonal. If you can calculate the photoluminescence, the broadband excitation for luminescence summing on the other thing. On the diagonal, you have the so-called resonant Rayleigh scattering. Resonant Rayleigh scattering is exactly no relaxation, but going out at the same energy where you came in. That's the resonant Rayleigh spectrum. In this context, we also discussed this S-shape this luminescence temp temperature dependence. And the thing that I want to mention here is the photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy. Phot what's photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy? Photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy is you, go you have your detector down here at a very low energy, at a 
somehow here down here in this, when, if this is the broadened absorption line down here, you have the detector. And then you collect and then you, then you see how much, how much excitons, how much luminescence you collect as a function of the excitation energy. That's photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy. And experimentally, typically experimentalists, I was told at that time, but everybody in the room is excluded and does it better, essentially often, often use PLE and publish this at absorption. And so, but that's not really true. Because if you calculate this and if you look at it experimentally, you see that PLE very much looks like absorption. Absorption is the dashed line. PLE is the other lines as a function of temperature. And so for, la for high excitation energies, PLE is the same like absorption, but for low excitation energies, PLA goes down to small values and at low temperatures to very small values. So the interpretation was that the interpretation comes, essentially that there is something like an effective mobility edge. If you have your detector down here at a certain energy, then there are very few minima from which, uh, so if the exciton at this, is, is, is this the exciton has to be essentially at this state in order to be detected with the detector at this energy. If you excite high up in the band, not high up, a few milli electron volts in gallium arsenide system, but uh, if you excite above this effective mobility edge, then the states make it down to the detector, to the detect detecting state down here. If, you, if the exciton is created somewhere else, it goes down, so whatever, if you pick a different detecting state, the electrons also make, the excitons make it down to this detector. If you, if you are below this mobility edge and your, ex and your exciting exciton in these kind of localized states below this kind of effective mobility edge, it will not make it to the other deep minimum. And that's a surprisingly strong, surprisingly abrupt effect. So if we plot PLE, then there is on a very small energy scale, PLE goes down. That's when you don't make it anymore to the detector. And at the same time, the sharp lines in p photoluminescence occur. So, the sh the, so really sharp lines occur from these lo localized states, not surprising at all. So, but that's somehow a surprising picture that in these systems you see such a quite good, quite good separation of is effectively delocalized states which find it to any detector and effectively localized states which don't make it to the other ones. That's a result from this relax relaxation also nice localization physics in this system. So, questions for me or no man? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ask me. No? Um, whether somebody in, no, I don't know. I, di I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I could look up who cites this paper. It's easy nowadays to see whether this is who cites this paper. Yeah. <laughs> so. So this was the third example. The last example is uh, what we looked at that time is a resonant Rayleigh scattering. Resonant Rayleigh scattering is conceptually a very simple experiment. Resonant Rayleigh scattering is the simplest case. If, if you have light up here and you have a white wall here, then that, get, that light gets reflected to your eyes. And it's not reflected specular, but it's reflected to all directions. And it's immediately reflected because it's not resonant. The white stuff here on the wall is not resonant to the exciting light. It's different if it's different if if different is if the incident light is resonant to some internal excitations because then if the light waves comes in, it essentially excites all the excitons. The excitons rotate. The dipole moment of the exciton rot rotates. The incident light wave is gone and the excitons still rotate and rotate and rotate. If they rotate at different frequencies, then they get out of, out of phase. And sometimes they add, sometimes they subtract each other. And that means essentially that the late emission comes from, goes to all directions. 
and uh, comes to all directions and that you essentially get speckles as function of space and time because if all these excitons do their own thing, then maybe you see them all, you see them maybe all just in, just in phase and so you say that's bright, it's bright and for you it's all destructive and so you don't see it and a moment later it is destructive for you and bright for somebody else. So, the, so therefore if you have the detector here, a time resolved detector, you will see over the lifetime of the excitons you will see speckles as function of angle long and angle and time from these excitons being out of phase. So we calculate is what you shall actually see. So you see a lot of speckles, bright and dark spots, and you average over many, many systems, then all these speckles are gone. And this is resonant really our, our prediction confirmed by some experiments um, um, of resonant of the resonant Rayleigh signal of excitons. Yeah, so so what do you see? This is this is the angle where the light comes out. This is the time. If at time zero the light comes in, then at the very first moment all excitons, all excitons are in phase. And if they're all in phase, they emit just in the specular direction. That's what you call specular reflection from a mirror. If all ex in the mirror, all the electrons are in time, uh, in phase when the light wave comes and therefore they emit just specularly. So if you go in at this angle, then immediately there will be a sharp specular reflection in the, in, the specular, yeah, in the specular direction. That's this sharp line of high intensity. How long does it live? It lives until the exciton has been come, gone out of phase. So essentially that lives one over the inhomogeneous the over one over the inhomogeneous lifetime. And then our prediction was that after that time there should be enhanced backscattering. That's kind kind of nice because you saw, I saw, told you at the beginning, enhanced backscattering is weak localization, is the small elephant is the small elephant. And so it's nice that you see enhanced backscattering, that you see enhanced backscattering in in resonant Rayleigh, in resonant Rayleigh scattering. If you look closer, and if the color, if the color is good, then you see that this enhanced backscattering feature start, gets smaller over time. Smaller, I mean, in angular direction. So it's not very, it's it's not very sharp. It's much broader than in the original raindrop weak localization backscattering. And it gets smaller over time. What is behind that? If the exciton, if the exciton gets created somewhere, then we see, then it will first ballistically spread out and not notice that it's localized. And at a certain time, it will local, it will realize. We saw this earlier in the talk. At a certain time, it will realize, hey, I'm a, I'm a localized exciton. So I can't spread anymore. And therefore, if you convert now. Small in real space, expanding in real space, if you convert it into K space, wave function space or angle space, it means you start out very broad in, angles, in angular space and get smaller and smaller in angular space until you don't expand in more in real space and therefore you don't get smaller in, in angular space as well. This is in homogeneous line. This is in hom here, yeah. So it means that you expect to get both lines. It's just an automaton. Yes. Um, otherwise, it would be the homogeneous kind. Hmm? It's otherwise, it would be the homogeneous kind. So you take the six, you take the, the inhomogeneous kind. So it means you expect to get both lines. Yes, broad compared to this exciton and to the inhomogeneous part. And yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I do that. I do that broad, but nevertheless, all of the all components of the broad excitation get specularly reflected at the beginning. At the specularly reflected at the beginning. Then there's something which I cannot advertise enough because it's we didn't publish it enough at that time. It's published in a big review of mine, but nobody, not not enough people read that, and <laughs> it's kind of un kind of so. But so, so somebody else could reinvent this in the first letter or so. Um, 
that there should also be some enhanced forward scattering. That at long time there is also the same feature repeated in forward, in forward direction, and that's something which I have don't really understand, and I think you, the world has not yet really understood and really understood. Even though there's a very a three-line derivation of why, why it's there should be a forward scattering, <laughs> but it's only a hand waving, and then you get the forward scattering out of this. So this is, a, and if the time dependence, I don't show the details, but the time dependence is the time dependence is also influenced by the by the level repulsion feature of the individual states. Though, um, that's the old physics. Now I use the chance to tell you something about the new star. The new stuff show you some beautiful pictures from the recent years, and that is that's some experimental experimental data from Christoph Linaus' group from with some Japanese uh, orange uh, uh, sample samples. This is zinc oxide nano needles, and the experiment is very simple. You go in with red light. You go in with red light and see whether there's second harmonic generation, so whether there's blue light here. This is 100, this is one micrometer, therefore the red wavelength is like this, and the red wavelength averages over, the red wavelength average over many, many needles, so this is essentially, you should expect that's a homogeneous sample if you look at it with the eyes of red light. But that's not, that's not what you see, second harmonic generation, it's very inhomogeneous. This is experimental data that you see that on a 30 micrometer scale, you see very, very big differences from insect harmonic generation. And our explanation for this is that there are some places where the red light bounces back and forth a few times, but bounces back and forth a few times. And if this is, if you, so if this, Red photon is if this red light finds the right spot, it bounces back and forth in a small region, therefore increases effectively the intensity and therefore increases second harmonic gener generation. And this is this is probably what we what I'm talking about. About probably is a different. If I think it's a if, if it's a different thing, because we find the same thing in our simulations. Yes. 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 But our understanding is that it's not. Our understanding is that our feeling is that it's not from density fluctuation. Yes, it's density fluctuation. But I think it's. Not the density fluctuations that you see, but the happy coincidence that you bounce around after f that bouncing around a few times, you find the same place uh, before you get out of this. So that again, it's like like what we saw here that if you have this binary alloy, nobody knows where the localiz localized states are, but they are somewhere, and of course they are related to the density. Of density fluctuation, but you don't see it's not the highest or the lowest region, but somewhere. And so here, there seems to be somewhere the right conditions for the right conditions for the right conditions for second harmonic generation that you bounce around for, uh, for a long time. That is kind of surprising. First of all, because it's pretty homogeneous on a, this length scale. It's also surprising because is that most of the modes at this frequency are delocalized. So essentially you have quite localized states, even though you are very delocalized. So that's not my picture of Anderson localization, where we had localized states, delocalized states, and then look, so. This is a few exceptionally localized states in the sea of, un, of delocalized states, which I don't know what, I don't know anything, I don't know what words even to use. There are very few papers about anomaly, Anomaly strongly localized states in a sea of delocalized modes. This is a difference from what is called this wide band wavelength. This wide, wide. The the around the, around the band yeah. gets a bit of size, uh, yeah. many particles, and it's a random, and you have a number of random uh, micro cavities. Yes. Uh, Yeah. And when you have a microcavity, of course, you have a hand frequency 
Yes, so yes, it's very close to this random, la this random lasers, and there is, yes, it's very, cl very close to random lasers and probably very much related to that. That there are somehow these very special conditions, but I see very little theory about, I know very little theory about, yeah, about random lasers. This picture was done by the experimentalists, so I hope that it's about what the experimentalists do. <laughs> so <laughs> just go <laughs> go in from the side, go in with this. I think they collect the, they collect they collect the light with they collect the blue light with this norm, and go in from the side with the red light, as far as I understand. I think the red laser spot is very broad on the scale, but, but the uh, spectral resolution in the last picture came, in the last picture the spectral resolution came from, came from, came from collecting with this norm, with a scanning optical microscope with the blue light. So you collect the blue light and excite very spatially broad with red light. So, so I think the, as far as I know, but. So this is essentially these kind of special modes seen in this nice zinc oxide, zinc oxide systems here. And um, so this is the distribution of intensities. The uh, distribution of ex intensities is essentially a boring Gaussian distribution of the background. And then these some, some outliers, these high, high intensity tails, which is experiment and also co this is FDDT simulations, so essentially showing also that there are some, some points, some heavy, lucky micro cavities forming there where you see where the electron spends a lot of time. And if you look, and you can also measure, the experimentalists can also measure how much time the light spends in these micro cavities by you go in with two laser pulses, and then you look at the second harmonic generation as a function of the time delay between the two laser pulses. And if they are just additive uh, in the right phase, then you get a lot of second harmonic generation. If you have, if they are out of phase, then the out of phase and the first has not died when the second one comes, then they then they then they will interfere. And so if you therefore if you see this, if you see this, if you look at this fringe resolved interferometric autocorrelation, then you see as a function of the delay time a lot of oscillations, and you see that the light stays. So 100 femtoseconds in the zinc oxide needle forest, and 100 femtoseconds is pretty is pretty long time. You bounce a very many f times back and forth between these needles before you come out at these very special spots. And I show you the same thing, the same thing even nicer in an even nicer system. That's gold nanosponges. Gold nanosponges is something that experimentalists and in Ilmenau do. Did I bring a picture? No, I didn't bring a picture how, how they do it, but essentially they have a, a vapor, they have these little boxes where they want to have the nanosponges in, doing by standard etching of silicon. Then they have a silver layer and a gold layer on top of this, evaporating this, then they melt it, so then they may form droplets on the silicon in these little boxes. You have these drops of silicon and then of gold silver alloys. And then you cool it down and you get a phase separation of silver and gold, of a gold rich and a silver rich phase, and then they etch away with an acid uh, silver and you end up with these nice gold sponges. And so we'll uh, see what happens if you go in with a light pulse and excite it with a short laser pulse, this gold sponges. And so the first thing, maybe I should start it again. So this. The laser pulse came, so you get me scattering, just because this is the light wave is huge. This is 100 nanometer here, so this is much smaller than the light K, the light. So, but it's a me scatterer. And now, after a long time, when the scattered light is gone for a long time already, you see on a logarithmic scale here, you see that there's still some excitation sitting in some spots here and being hanging around for 
long, long time on a really small spot. So again, the light, the weight, light wave is like this. This is 100 nanometer, and you have this spot essentially with 10 or 20 nanometer. That's amazing that, electro that, that electrodynamic energy likes to be, that it happens to, that it likes to be on such a small length scale after exciting on a such huge length scale. This is, um, I show you, I show that in a, I hope I brought this. Um, so this is now 50, 70, fem to se 70 femtoseconds or so. Everything happens much small, uh, faster in, 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 in the plasmon system. If you, um, why, do we look at the, why do we look at this? Because if there is really this strong enhancement of fields in, a such, a small, uh, in such a small area, then nonlinear effects should be large in these systems. If you want to show that nonlinear effects is large, we, we, look, we have to look, we have to find an experiment which is highly nonlinear. And one highly nonlinear experiment is electron emission. If you go in with a, la if you go in with a very long, long wave laser pulse, long wave la light with 1.66 micrometer wavele wavelengths, then you need essentially seven photons to kick an electron out of gold. So it's a seven order of process, so the electron count, and so you, and what then if you do that, you see you'll find a lot of electrons going out of these gold sponges, and it goes about with the seventh power of the laser power, so that and the many electrons show that the sponges really enhances dramatically the field strength. And similar nice also another nice experiment is you if you go and have a tip and measure. Um, you have a tip and you go in with the light, have metal tip and see how much you enhance the, f and the uh, how much you enhance, how much enhanced field you find here below the tip. And you then, our calculation showed again that there should be small regions somehow heavy, nice places where essentially you have a micro cavity, now a micro cavity, metallic micro cavity, whatever you say it, where, where you find a lot of intensity living for a long time and di different, different hotspots having different frequencies, having different sizes, and being somewhere on this gold micro, micro on this gold nanosponge. And that's experimental, da experimental data, gold nanosponge, gold nanosponge with this AFM, with AFM data and, and an AFM tip, and then see tip enhanced scattering, and you see these resonances, which are normally small in real space, so this is now nine nan nanometers in real space and very sharp in frequency space. So that's a very nice, very nice system of micro uh, collection of micro cavities. Our, uh, when we try our advertisement, our advertisement's marketing slogan for this uh, gold nanosponge physics is that a lot of people do, do dye molecules in some kind of nano antenna and publish paper about with FIP, uh, FIP written na nano antenna and then try to place a molecule right at the right spot. And here we argue that this kind of system provides millions of nano antenna, some of them being very good and some of them being not good, but you get them for essentially for free. So somewhere there is a good spot for doing whatever nonlinear experiment you want to do. And the other, the marketing slogan is also that this order is very robust against this order. So if you have this nano antenna and you, something goes wrong with the nano antenna, it gets hot or cold and it changes, then it, you run out of resonance for the nano experiment. Here you run out of resonance in the one spot, but you run into resonance in another spot. So therefore, there's, we love this order as this being nonlinear physics of this order system because this order is robust, robust against this order. So that's that against some disorders different filling factors make different things. These, these resonances are, are rather local. If, you, if on a calculation you remove the inner part and, and replace it by an effective medium, then this is not changed. So that shows that these are rather local effects. And the last surprise. Do it look like space have different frequencies? They have different frequencies. Yes, they have different frequencies. So this should be a color coding for nanometer, okay. for nanometer light and for this, for the calculation of these gold nanosponges, okay. and 
finally preparing, coming to this confer co conference, I read your, pa read your papers. I loved them immediately. My student who loves to write Python scripts made a little bit a lot of parameter selection so you can play around and you can uh, get uh, white, smooth and white noise. Put, wise, you have a white noise, you have white noise here, then you get some selective, some wave function, you get, you can smoothen this, and this, this is white noise, this is wave function of white noise, but we smoothened it, and that's the localization landscape, and that's something which I, after this conference, I think we, I try to understand how much the smoothening, the landscape looks, how much, the, what the relation is between smoothened landscape and optimum fluctuation theory compared to this localization landscape, and I asked my student to, com to see how, in how many of these, in how many of these uh, basins the wave function sits. So this wave function essentially sits with 95% in one basin and only a little bit in other basins and so on. And so we made this kind of, of inverse participation ratio. And that's the, that's the blue dots, which you don't see so well. Essentially, essentially that says how many in how many basins this wave function sit as a function of energy and the red dots are these optical matrix elements. So essentially you see in the next few graph that if you are in the region where you have these strong, the quite well localized states, which a typical matrix element here, then they are sitting essentially in one, ba in one basin here. And if you go high up here, then you get this random fluctuation thing high above this deep, and then they sit, start to sit in many, in many basins. So that's not a surprise for the experts, but since I have only very recently started thinking about this, I love, I love to see that. Something else that I find interesting, which I don't know yet whether there's something to learn from this, um, that we saw this equation, u is, we saw this, u is, u is psi, is sum over the, how do you, tri tribe of fundamentals, this great word, tribe of fundamentals, it's a sum over all wave functions, but essentially the, fundament, the, essentially the fundamentals, and the, with the prefactor being my optical matrix element here. So in this sense, u squared is something like, reminds me of this optical density, of this absorption thing, because if you had woke me up at night and asked me what is this, I would say, oh, this is the absorption, stre the absorption strength. That's something for me to think about, and for you as no master, I really like this concept of the localization landscape. And I think I stay, stayed somehow in time so that we can still have questions here. I love this order. I said, like I said this earlier, this is my picture of a la la love this order. But this is a sheer, sheer summary, and I thank you for your attention. These ones, yeah. Um, probably yes, whether it's really on the surface depends on depends on this order. So depending for different filling factors, it goes much deeper in there. So this is not a side. This is a cut through the system, so it can be more sense. But yes, it would be. I think for for many, it would be an interesting system to have just a, a very rough sur a very rough surface. There is a lot of literature about two dimensional films and so on and so forth. But I think our system, this is, you can call it a rough surface, but this rough surface is essentially, there are holes in there, and I'm not sure whether I brought this picture, so I think it's not worthwhile, see, worthwhile looking for this, because this is really more, it's, if you're, it's a little bit like if you have a sponge, you need a, it, it needs to be spongy. It needs to be spongy in the outer part. You don't care about the inner part, but at least outer, 
the holes that you see in the, it must be really holes on the outside. It cannot be just rough. So you're saying you are also seeing the strong enhancement inside the device? Yes, because the light, depending on, depending the light, penetra the, it penet the light penetrates into the gold because this is 100 nanometers only. And if there's also air, then the light can, the light or the electric energy can really penetrate far in, far into the thing because it's so, it's essentially a skin depth thing. So it really goes in. It really goes in, in quite, a, quite a lot. Um, I said it's amazing that the light, that the electromagnetic energy gets focused to a 10 nanometers, 20 nanometer size. Given that you go in, that you go in with this huge wavelength here, on the, and that's essentially, I think, a two-step process that, is an, that this is me, that you see a me, big me dipole resonance from just a average, an average gold particle and so that already focuses somehow, somehow to these metal particles. And then one, once this is doing this di big dipole resonance, then some of this energy ends up in these small little spots. So, so, you, so I'm, I used your question to emphasize the dipole character. I think Lord was next. So it's in 13th century that this digital micro nickel particles are colored. Okay, this is Faraday coloring. Okay, it did not over time. So, the, so this is the this is the beautiful Faraday, the beautiful Faraday color. And the, ama the amazing thing is here, this is Faraday's gold given to me at a meeting. It's amazing that it still contain that this colloidal gold still has the same color after 100 years. That's I think it's more it's even more impressive. And every plasmon talk on the world, I think, has somehow this famous Lycurgus cup. So of course, but since this is for semiconductors, I didn't dare to show my fa this plasmon pictures. Um, there is also, the, I think this, um, there's also this concept of bound states in the continuum. So I think it's also worthwhile to think whether these special, special resonance cavities can be also understood as one of some of these ideas which are around for bound states on continuum. But uh, I think there were more questions. Yeah. Yes, for the uh, sigma uh, Hubble coloration, you, you can interpret that the, the exponent, uh, the inverse of the exponent times of <coughs> the uh, moment when the, uh, you, you get measurement of the point or, or the point gets neutralized. But you could also interpret that when you get phase mapping, the, the region of, of space where you get phase mapping or the region of space where the, the absolute harmonic is in measurement. So how can you decorrelate between these three possibilities? I'm not sure whether... Um, I'm not sure whether this what if you really think about what you what you call phase matching in this kind of system, you would say essentially phase matching is some word for constructive interference. Yes. So I think um, yeah, but I think here that the second harmonic our picture is that the second harmonic generation goes out pretty soon okay. out of the system. So our understanding is because it's increased nice with the theoretical calculation that you see that this is a res that this is localization of the fundamental and not localization and that the second harmonic can be assumed to go out very fast that you don't have to have double resonances but that's more what the calculation what the calculation show and in, in a recent paper we all but it's a good question because in a recent paper for the gold system we are right now looking at small at third second generation and third harmonic generation and seeing, comparing the differences and seeing that there are sometimes there is also resonance on the, uh, on the higher ha double resonances involved. So that's a common from you. First, you mostly propagate in air, you are phase matched. And second, the fact that there is no digital and of large cavity. So you are going to the lower speed, the distance being the, the second part. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So then phase matching is for the It could be, and I think that this kind of double resonance that you have a resonance on the second harmonic or the third harmonic generation and the fundamental that seems to be a, be a role in other systems that 
uh, Lina does experimentally and we do theory for is when you have this zinc oxide, you can also play around and cover this gold thing, this, this gold nanosponges with zinc oxide, with zinc oxide and then to have semiconductor close to metal and in this system we have indications for double resonances. Uh, yesterday, you, yesterday you would say we do that tomorrow in the, in the discussion <laughs> session. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And the, the geometry of the dome. How do you know what the dome must generate as a mass? Um, we, and there are, there is, there is now an atomic, the, the questions, what do we, if you have the, if this is the experimental gold nano sponge, how do we get it into the computer? How did we get this into the computer? So there's one, this, how did it call you if you do the tomography? There's one thing where you really did tomography so that we really know the structure of one of them. And the other, and but most of the calculation, we're just looking at this kind of thing and then inventing some random model, some random model which essentially is random numbers, Fourier transformed and so on with, uh, to, to enforce a certain correlation function, then flooding this up to a certain level. And then if it looks a lot like this, then we were happier. At the very beginning, we just punched little holes into a big gold sphere and had little holes there and little spheres there. So we improved with making this looking more and more like the experiment, but now like the experimental pictures. But now we also have some case where we know experimentally really the experimental structure and we can then use the experimental structure. But it's very hard to talk about this, uh, how you how you do this, by how you do essentially take away the gold and see how the structure is. We saw, I heard a talk about this yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. There are a lot of questions, but let's thank the speaker again. And <laughs>